Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining our third OnClive webinar on managing lung cancer patients through the COVID-19 pandemic, What to Know. I'm your moderator this evening, Gina Columbus. I'm the editorial director for OnClive, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you again. The mission of this webinar is to provide our listeners with a free-form discussion on how you and your colleagues are managing your patients with lung cancer during the COVID-19 pandemic. As we have done in prior weeks, prior we will weeks. cover a list of topics that each faculty member will go into greater detail on and share their insights from the front lines. As you can see from the slide, tonight we'll be gaining plenty of international insight from a leader in the field based in Hong Kong, China, and how he has managed the risk of COVID-19 in patients with lung cancer. After spending some time in this discussion, we'll move on to focus on the management of stage three non-small cell lung cancer, as well as some take as well as taking some next steps with treatment modifications to reduce the risk of COVID-19 in our patients with lung cancer. So we have just a couple of quick housekeeping notes tonight. If you are listening to the webinar, we encourage you to submit any questions you have, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can during the QA portion of this webinar. Also, to expand your video player to full screen, click on the icon on the lower right of the player, hit escape on your keyboard to revert back to the smaller player. So we have a distinguished panel of experts for today's presentation, and I'll ask each of them to introduce themselves and give their title and affiliation. Dr. Agarwal. Hi, everyone. I'm Charu Agarwal. I'm the Leslie Heisler Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Abramson Cancer Center in the University of Pennsylvania. So nice to be here with everyone. Thank you. Dr. West. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Jack West. I'm Associate Clinical Professor in Medical Oncology at the City of Hope Cancer Center and the Executive Director of a remote consult service called Access Hope uh, as part of that. It's great to be here and not just because I've barely seen anyone all week, but it's, uh, it's always uh, a, a nice event here. Thank you. Dr. Pinnell? Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Nate Pinnell. I'm a uh, medical thoracic oncologist at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, associate Professor and uh, Director of the Lung Cancer Medical Oncology Program. Thank you. Dr. Liu? Hi, uh, Stephen Liu. I'm an Associate Professor and Director of Thoracic Oncology at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Mock. Hi, I'm Professor Tony Mock. I'm a Professor of Clinical Oncology at the China University of Hong Kong, and I focus on talking lung cancer, but too bad I don't know how to talk the virus. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And Dr. Mock, we're so excited to have you here this evening, although it's morning for you right now, um, to share some of your experiences with COVID-19 in Hong Kong. So um, as mentioned, this is the third webinar in our plan series. So anything that's not covered during this discussion can certainly be raised in subsequent webcasts. And we have a great deal of material to cover tonight, so let's begin. So to start us off, as I have been, I'd like to provide you some very quick numbers on the current state of COVID-19. Currently, as of today, the number of global confirmed COVID-19 cases are more than 1.3 million with more than 79,000 deaths. The United States has 395,011 confirmed cases with 12,754 deaths. We've heard about a surge of research efforts lately to develop vaccines and treatments against COVID-19 with a lot of investigational agents or therapies that are approved for other indications being explored in clinical trials. Meanwhile, we all continue to adhere to the social distancing guidelines that are, have been instilled upon us, but this is much more challenging to follow for our patients with serious medical conditions that require urgent attention. So over the last couple of weeks, we have discussed how COVID-19 has truly impacted everything from how our experts are managing lung cancer in their patients to preventive measures they're taking in practice. And we'll be hitting on some other impactful topics in the space tonight. With that, I would like to turn it toward our discussion with Dr. Mock. I know the panel has a number of questions for you, but would you care to first just share some of the experiences and how you have been handling all of this over in Hong Kong? Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be invited to this panel discussion. And it's so great to see all my lung cancer friends in the United States and all of you in good health. Uh, so Hong Kong, um, in a way we were blessed by the rehearsal in 2003 with the SARS. So when this come along, we kind of kick in rather quickly. So I briefly described uh, at three level, uh, from the government level, the hospital level, and the department on culture level, what uh, some of the activity we have done that help us to minimize the damage uh, to the situation. 
So starting off with the government, but being aware of this, so there's two things they have done really nicely. A lot of things they do badly, but there's two things they have done quite correctly. One is to promote the use of masks. I know that there was a lot of controversial uh, around this topic of surgical masks, uh, but in a sense is that we, when we experience the SARS, that we really believe that the masks had make a lot of difference. And you would, you would talk to the people from Korea, Singapore and um, China, they actually have the same experience, mask and hand wash will not have helped a lot. So basically, uh, the government started to promote the use of it in the same time they source the mask and increase the production so that people can get access to the masking. So I think that actually make a major difference in terms of the incident is the surgical mask. Second part they have done is to close the border because a lot of this can be likely from China at that time. We had about nine port of entry between China, air, sea, and the land. And so they narrowed down to only two being open. And so by having only two port open, they basically scan any people who come in. So try to make that as a first defense of the people bringing in the virus. So I think that prevent or reduce the number of influx of potential carrier into Hong Kong. So I think that is the two things the government had done quite nicely to help uh, reduction incident. And then um, one other thing they have done is the which is done a bit later is the social distancing because they, the social distancing impact on the economy. So they were reluctant in the beginning, but now that when they problem get worse, then they decide to do the social distancing, uh, stopping the school, uh, home office, and also restaurants actually because Chinese love to eat. So they did not close the restaurant entirely. They allow only four people per table and 1.5 meter between table. So it's kind of semi social distancing to keep ourselves fat, okay? Which is a nice thing because otherwise, you know, we would be really miserable, you know. Anyway, and so, so those kind of regulations do help, uh, but then other things that was more intimacy, like the bar, the, uh, the, um, the salon, the, uh, the facial place, you know, all those are closed. And so those are kind of the social distancing regulation that also help. Now in the hospital, the hospital, I think they have done a great job is the objective is first to protect the medical people. And then the second objective is so that the protected medical people can help the patient. I think this is kind of the mentality they have in mind. So two things they have done. First of all, they divided the hospital previously. Actually, the term come when we were doing SARS is called a dirty team and a clean team. Now they don't like the word dirty anymore. They say that it's called a uh, isolation uh, team or isolation uh, uh, virus management team. They give themselves a better name, but you know, in a way is that they are the one focusing on the management. So what is set up is like this. Anybody who walks through the hospital will get temperature check and ask about the symptom. If they have any apple respiratory symptom, any fever, they just stop there and then send them over to a screening area. In the screening area, they will get tested. And then with the testing, if they got positive, they will be admitted to a isolation ward with a negative pressure. And then it's a specific team of doctors um, composed of young and consultants to look after them and they rotate every two weeks or every four weeks and to look after that, that, that team. And then those people don't actually even go home. They actually stay in the hotel when they're at rest. And so that they will be focusing on the management and the other doctor in a sense that we are gut protected, we don't really have to deal with the respiratory symptom patient or so much of the, um, of the, uh, of, of the patient with fever. So in a way, it gives us a little bit of shielding to such, such that the non-dirty team or the, the, the regular business can go as usual as much as possible. Now, but then when you have a lot of people with fever and a lot of people with respiratory symptoms, so the only way to find out who is really having it or not is to facilitate a highly efficient testing method. So in the hospital, we have a 24 hour running viral lab now. The last time I heard they had almost like 20 people in the lab working around the clock and they do free testing shift. Okay, in a sense is that morning test, they get in afternoon, afternoon test, they get the result in the evening, evening test, they get it the next morning. So in a way is that you can kind of detain the people with respiratory symptoms in those rating area until the result come back. But if it's come back negative, they can proceed business as usual. If they get positive, then they go up to the isolation ward. So I think the hospital have done this in a major protective way. And then everybody in the so-called the exposed area, they will be fully geared at the PPE, not just surgical mask, uh, N95, protective gown and face shield. So, so they, they will be protected nicely when they're working in that area.
tough job, but they are doing a fantastic job. So I think that is what the hospital have done, try to protect so-called the staff from having the infection and such that they can run the business as usual. Now, the third is going back to the oncology. Now, uh, of course, our patient is at exposed risk, and then uh, you know they also uh, may be more susceptible. But so far, I'm lucky enough that we actually do not have a cancer patient so far being infected at this moment. Now, so what we have done is number one, we have within the department have an infection control team, and such that we have all the communication from the top to the bottom. We put our, ourselves in one um, WhatsApp group. And then all the communication can go within the infectious disease control group within the department. So we closely know what each other is doing. Uh, there's a few things we have done. First is about the uh, patient. We classify them into three groups. One group is the patient on active treatment that we cannot change. One group is on the less aggressive or maintenance therapy or immunotherapy or TKI that can receive, continue to receive treatment, but less frequently. And there's a follow-up group who do not need to be seen much. So the third group, which basically cancel the appointment, just give them a much later appointment to come back. So we reduce the low from, the, from that group. Patient on the maintenance group, we start to ask the question, do we need to give them as frequent as, as we used to? Do we really need to give Pample every three weeks? I have been promoting not to do that for a long time, but then they don't like it. But now this is the time. We really do not have to give the IO as frequent as we like it to be, or as they promote it to be. I mean, give it Pample every four weeks, every five weeks, every six weeks, I think it's okay as long as the patient is stable or we get responded. For TKI, we used to see them every six weeks to give them the prescription, but of course now we either ask them to come back later or try to give a one renewal uh, without seeing the patient, just talking to them on the phone and then give them a video prescription. And so that is good. However, on the patient who is on active treatment, like adjuvant for breast, or like the patient who are on the lymphoma protocol, we don't change at all. We give them exactly the same as we have been. So they reduce the overall workload uh, you know, for everybody and then reduce the number of patients who need to be sitting in the waiting room. But I can tell you that it's still very crowded in the waiting room. Uh, but, but all we can do is to have everybody mask, everybody tested. I mean, everybody gets screened before they come in. So that is more or less on the so-called the uh, oncology treatment level that we try to look into this uh, free group of patients differently and try to adjust uh, the management as such. Now, the one thing that is deferred a lot is the new patient. Now, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, a lot of our lung cancer patient or GI patient, they need an endoscopy before the diagnosis. But basically, previously, they stop all the endoscopic procedure because of the aerosol issue. Now they start to relieve a little bit. But so there is a black lock of the diagnosis of new, new, case, new cases. And also we take in the new case a lot slower. So that is one part that I think we're still facing one, some difficulty is on the enrollment of the new cases. And so basically those are the three level of things that we have done. And um, so far we are hand managing okay. Uh, you know, in a way is that uh, because of the protection from the rest of the hospital, our workload is actually a little bit easier. So I get a little bit bored, you know, in a way that I don't come to travel to see you guys. I got less work to do. So it's, it's okay. We're hanging on there. Tony, this was uh, terrific. We have so much to learn from you and your experience. Um, could you tell us, you, you mentioned that you don't have a lot of lung cancer patients that have been COVID positive, mm -hmm. uh, but what is your general uh, approach to patients that are COVID positive? Are you, um, I assume you're holding systemic infusional treatments, but could you tell us a little bit about your approach and you know right. how you're approaching TKIs? Right. So first of all, uh, so far, the Hong Kong statistics is quite good. So overall, we only had about 960 cases up to this day. So in total. And then all of these cases, a lot of this, you know, about this 900 cases, more than 500 are returning from outside Hong Kong. So basically, you know, uh, they are not probably not their cancer patient or at least not our cancer patient because they come back from another country. So the number of cancer patients, if you look at this number, is actually very small compared to our cancer population. Uh, so up to this moment, uh, we don't really have to handle any lung cancer patient with COVID-19 at this moment. So at least in my, in my department. Uh, 
up to this moment. Um, and also, a lot of them may already get screened, you know, in the beginning, and then if they're positive, they actually already managed it in the infectious disease ward and not in the oncology ward. Uh, Tony, can I ask though, if you had a patient who uh, has been diagnosed as positive, if, if they have had treatment suspended, is there a point at which, what is the threshold for resuming treatment or does it depend completely on what that treatment in question would be? Right. So basically I can only answer this question hypothetically because we have not had one yet. So um, we do, you know, for the patient who got recovered of COVID-19, basically, you know, uh, depending on how bad they have been, you know, in a way is that some of them may be just mild symptomatic, uh, mild, uh, mild uh, uh, pneumonitis, and then they recover. So for those patients, I really do not see too much of an issue in a way is that they're not immunocompromised. And then as long as not, I'm not going to give them hugely cytotoxic drug. I think relatively they should be okay. Now, asking the question whether, you know, once they got a viral infection, are they in high risk of ILD to immunotherapy or TKI? I don't think I have answer for that. I think this is an interesting investigational question, but at this moment, there's no reason to suspect that they may be any higher risk than the other uh, folks. So I think we will likely go by judgment case by case uh, at this moment. Oh, that's great. Um, one of the things that uh, is another big part of your job, in addition to taking care of lung cancer patients, is running and putting people on clinical trials. And certainly uh, in the U.S., the COVID uh, pandemic has impacted certain trials have been put on hold. Um, there have been guidances in terms of, you know, who should be coming for extra visits and, and extra procedures that are purely research. How are you handling uh, clinical trials and research projects in Hong Kong now? Right. So a very excellent question. And uh, we just had this debate within the clinical trial team just a, you know, a few weeks ago. So basically, when this first start, we did not know how bad the situation may turn. We basically stopped enrollment of all trials. Um, so because we do not know how your resources need to be dedicated and we do not want any uh, exposure. So at one point, we actually stopped all new enrollment. Patient on trial can still come back because they would need their medicine, they need their monitoring, but then we actually stop enrollment. Now we start to lose up a little bit. So now we start to um, enroll uh, some of the, uh, some, uh, we open some of the trial, uh, but step by step, do it very slowly. So I think there's inevitable um, that clinical trial will be stopped for a while. And, and, and that only when situation ease up, then probably release it step by step. Tony, I'm, I'm glad you haven't had any positive patients. I think that's, that's remarkable. And so this will again be hypothetical, but you know, I have a patient that is EGFR positive that's taking first line osimertinib and she's been doing quite well for about a year and, and she is now COVID positive. Would you continue osimertinib in this setting? She, she had fever, she seems to be on the mend or do you think it's important to hold that? Do you think I'm increasing her risk for, for respiratory complications? Sure. So what, what I would have done is that because patients on osimertinib, they probably had an excellent response, the cancer is probably not an acute problem. So in my experience, just like normal ordinary patient, even without the COVID-19, if I stopped osimertinib, if I knew that the cancer is actually not at a nice setting situation, Usually stopping it for four weeks, five weeks is probably not going to cause them any um, so-called cancer-related problem. So I would be comfortable, you know, to stop the drug just because I don't know what is happening with the COVID-19 and I just don't know whether there's any interaction. So for that purpose, I would stop it because of the risk of the cancer-related mortality is not going to be too high. And then I'll just see how the COVID-19 goes. And then uh, once it's stable, then we start the osmentative. So just kind of like an educated guess, I think this is probably what I would, would have done. Um, this is fascinating. So Tony, one of the things that we are now struggling with is, uh, should we be checking or, or testing all of our patients before we start them on therapy? Um, our new patients, our new starts, chemo IO, um, you know, limited state small cell who are starting concurrent chemo radiation who may be at higher risk for myelosuppression. Um, right. What has your strategy been? Right. This is a tough question. Um, we thought about that as well. So first of all, 
uh, there's two layer to this question. First is that how many asymptomatic carry are there? So we actually don't have the answer to that. So even the infectious disease guys just talk about say, yes, we have cases that patient got infected asymptomatic and they are the carrier and they can spread the virus. This is what we know. But how many of them are around? How often did this happen? We don't really have a statistic on it. If it's not frequent, then testing everybody for this, it should be probably not cost effective. If it's a lot happen quite frequently, then it may be the case. In Hong Kong, actually, we have one other blessing is the Department of Health is doing a pretty good job is to trace the contact. So every single patient got infected, they trace their contact and then ask the contact to be quarantined for 14 days. And then the, during the quarantine, some of them will have to put on a bracelet and they cannot leave the house. And so in a sense, they give a little bit idea who may be the close contact of the infected person. And then, of course, those are the, if they happen to have cancer, I would definitely test for them before I go on any therapy. But then if they are just an ordinary patient, at this moment, I don't think that it's required unless we know that the number of silent carrier is high in the community. But obviously, I don't have the number. So that's part one. Number two is how easy you got tested and whether the testing will defer the treatment. So in our hospital, in a, you know, right now, uh, since we got a 24 hour for the time being, very quick answer, and then the cost is not too high, then of course you can test more people if you have a concern. But on the other hand, if it's costly, difficult to get the testing, and it's going to defer treatment, then I think you have to weigh the risk and the benefit, you know, in a way of deferring uh, the risk of deferring treatment versus the incident of a silent carry is relatively low. Tony, uh, one of the things that uh, I've been working on at City of Hope has been promoting telemedicine, uh, both in terms of its use in remote consults for people who are outside of City of Hope and potentially all over the, the, the U.S., but also uh, for our patients in the clinics. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is rolling out pretty quickly. It's, of course, been an idea that has been waiting for its moment, but has been really underutilized until very recently. But in a world of social distancing and trying to manage people uh, without necessarily having them coming in and, and being exposed, telemedicine seems to be kind of tailor-made for that and is, is really rolling out very quickly here. What's it been like there? Was it used Mm -hmm. much before coronavirus and has coronavirus uh, that threat and real concern kind of catalyzed much greater use of it in mm. Hong Kong and, and more broadly in China? Right. Uh, no, thank you for bringing up this, this question. So before I answer the question, I have to introduce about the medical system in Hong Kong a little bit so that you understand why it works or doesn't work. So Hong Kong has a public health care system and also had a private healthcare system. The public health system is actually run by something called the Hospital Authority, which is owned by the government. And basically it's almost like semi-free healthcare. In a way is that you got most of your testing, seeing doctor that's free of charge and only medication that the patient may have to pay for. And then there are 33 hospitals around Hong Kong. And then the private system is private hospital, quite expensive, and then you know, pay as you go type of thing and also under insurance. So those are the uh, kind of the system. Now, talking focusing most first on the public system. There are 33 hospitals and the whole Hong Kong is only 400 square miles. From one tip to Hong Kong, the other part of Hong Kong only take 45 minutes in driving. It's a very small place for a lot of hospitals. So patient basically can go to see a doctor in, in a hospital close by without too much travel. So, you know, telemedicine in a small place, it does not make as much sense as a big America, you know, in a way of patients that travel to the city uh, to get their, their health care. So I think slightly the geographic situation make telemedicine within Hong Kong less attractive. Now, and so coming to the question is that because of social distancing, should we do that? Uh, I think it's, we are doing it now, uh, but then mostly by phone to renew the prescription. Uh, in a sense, is that the blood test still has to be done in a hospital, 
the x-ray still have been done in hospital. If you're in the hospital for blood tests and x-ray already, you may as well see the doctor. It's slightly different from the United States where you can have your blood tests, have your x-ray done in your local hospital, and then teleconference to see an oncologist in a city. So it's slightly different maneuver there. So I think within Hong Kong, the concept of telemedicine may not prevail too far. However, there's one point. I think we do also have a lot of patients from China. Uh, you know, because especially in the private practice, that's what I'm trying to introduce to you, in the private practice, that actually they have a lot of visiting patients from China because we got a better healthcare system. And so for those patients now, they cannot come to see the doctor in Hong Kong, that part, the telemedicine will rise. And already we have uh, uh, set it up uh, with a few of the telemedicine company uh, that will try to help the doctor, private doctor in Hong Kong to look up the patient in China. Um, you mentioned earlier that there were delays or at least um, a backlog um, for things like bronchoscopies where you're aerosolizing um, particles that might put people at risk for, for the COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. Has this impacted being able to get tissue biopsies for newly diagnosed patients? And has this impacted how you would do molecular testing um, mm -hmm. using perhaps more non-invasive kinds of testing? Yeah, um, so the, the bronchoscopy and the OGD had uh, basically all the elective one had shut down. And then you, you probably know that there is a, a, a black lock because of that. Um, however, uh, there is also the private hospital who may still want the business. So the, in some selective private hospital, they still do that. So there's still a little bit of shift from where to get the procedure done. You know, if, for example, if a patient got a lung mask and then because of shutdown in the public hospital, they may just go to the private and get it. So I think at this moment, I do not see a rise in a non-invasive testing uh, at the moment. And also for the non-invasive testing, at this moment on the past, we still rely on foundation and, um, and, and, and Garden 360. Locally, we have a uh, you know, small company, but it's not as good as Garden and, and Foundation. And now to send the blood to the United States, there's some, defer, uh, some delay as well. So that part has not really picked up as much. Did you see a similar delay in surgeries? Um, you know, with, with surgeons in the operating rooms, maybe not as available. Uh, were you leaning more towards SBRT, for example, uh, for early stage cancers? Uh, I have not seen that yet because uh, right now I think it's still relatively early. And honestly speaking, our surgeon had always had the delay anyway. <laughs> the wait list in the hospital is always long. So whether from long to longer, people may not notice as much as different. So I, I do not see the impact of higher number of uh, SBRT for the time being. And also actually the, even our radiation procedure is slowed down because that uh, some of their radiographer, you know, we have to put them a shift and some of them work from home, you know, I mean, the, the whole thing slowed down, you know. All right, thank you so much. What a great discussion. Um, could we actually turn the conversation over to how you're all currently managing your patients kind of going off of this aftermath with stage three non-small cell lung cancer? Is there anything you're doing differently, moving away from surgery or taking a more hypofractionated approach with radiation? Uh, for me or for the, the whole group? For Very everyone. <laughs> I don't, I, I stopped talking. Let you guys talk first. I, I, I'd be the end. So I think well, for, at our center, we're using... Um, our multidisciplinary tumor boards, which are all being conducted virtually to really have these discussions um, and making these individualized decisions. Um, I think right now, at least in Philadelphia, we are uh, trying to minimize surgery, but it's not something that's uh, completely uh, been abandoned just yet. Um, and we are, uh, you know, sort of following the ACS guidelines in terms of uh, prioritizing surgery. And then um, there are certain circumstances where we are actually trying to use sequential chemoradiation approaches. I know that's not usually our preferred standard, but there are some patients where we are just not able to or just don't feel confident that they'll be able to withstand concurrent chemoradiation. And, you know, pre-COVID-19 pandemic, we may have, um, you know, sort of increased uh, the number of visits for these patients or increased our um, you know, sort of um, 
uh, follow-ups uh, follow for these patients. But I think now we are leaning back a little bit and uh, feeling perhaps a little bit more comfortable with using sequential chemotherapy and radiation. Um, we are also trying to extend the interval between introduction of um, consolidation durvalumab um, as much as we can. So even though pre-COVID, we tried to start within two to four weeks of completion of chemo radiation, I think in this uh, day and age, we are feeling okay uh, stretching it out to four to six um, weeks um, post completion of chemo radiation. Curious to see what others are doing. Uh, I'll volunteer that I, I started to wonder, I actually saw just recently someone who was on, who just completed weekly carbo paclitaxel. Uh, she's actually in her 80s and she did well with weekly carbo paclitaxel and the complete definitive uh, concurrent chest radiation. And I had a fleeting moment thinking, oh, you know, I wonder, uh, you know, if I'll want to move away from weekly carbo taxol with the visits with me before realizing, wait a minute, they're coming in daily for radiation anyway, that doesn't really change anything. Uh, and I, I think that this kind of distills down the problem that we face of trying to balance the potential changes we might be inclined to make for coronavirus exposure uh, and the risks associated with developing a, a more serious you know, complications from it versus under treating with what we would really consider to be the best treatment. I think that we, at least in places where the risk is not as, as clear as it is say in New York right now, um, where I am, it's the, the rate per 100,000 people is pretty low and we're taking great pains to minimize the risks for people who are on treatment. I would be reluctant myself to have a patient undergo uh, what is clearly not very well tested and a lesser approach like uh, sequential. And I know, Charo, you brought this up in the context of somebody who is maybe not a strong candidate for concurrent, and that's a different situation. But for someone who is, the best data that we have are with the Pacific approach, concurrent chemo radiation to 60, 60, low 60s gray, uh, and about six weeks of, of chemo, followed by the maintenance or the consolidation durvalumab for up to a year. Now, I think if we could do the durvalumab, I don't think it's, I think it's perfectly great to do that anywhere in that, you know, four to six weeks versus two. I don't think we need to rush that. I would love to give it the durvalumab every four weeks instead of every two. And if a patient is running aground with increasing side effects after seven or eight months, I would not be inclined to, to, to really push them that hard to continue beyond that. But I would be inclined to frame a treatment approach that still uses Pacific as the cornerstone, unless I was in a place that was a complete hotbed where the risk is is very high just from coming in every day. And I would just need to recognize that we're talking about a life-threatening cancer that people do have. I would prioritize the problem we know they have over the problem they could possibly get. Um, and I think we we do, you know, we're all watching the news and seeing the numbers go up. I wouldn't want to over magnify that problem because it's so dreaded and feared over the problem we actually have right now in the clinic. We have a little bit of flexibility with, with stage three because there are a lot of different approaches and we don't clearly know that one is greater than the other. And while I agree that we never want to offer an inferior treatment, there's a little bit of, of variability in our practice patterns. If you're operating within Pacific, for example, we could do induction chemotherapy before beginning chemo radiation, not an inferior approach. In fact, uh, some prefer that approach. And if you were right in the heart of the storm, where infection was really gripping. Then, and I think there's something to be said about maybe buying some time with induction. For us, we, we don't know when that, that peak will be uh, largely, and those projections keep changing very frequently. I know the no numbers in DC are only gonna get worse. And so right now, uh, am I wise by putting things off for six weeks when six weeks, it could be a lot, a lot worse. Where I will say we've, we've changed some of our practice uh, at Georgetown, 
would be in the neoadjuvant approach for uh, a, a stage three resectable non-small cell. Historically, we had been a chemo radiation uh, followed by surgery, and now we are much more chemotherapy followed by surgery and then post-op radiation. And I think that that is a direct result of, of trying to minimize risk and, and decrease uh, decrease exposures. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the, uh, the specific situation wherever you are matters a lot in terms of how you're going to manage this. Uh, places that are either past their surge or really haven't started, I think it's not necessarily key that you make a lot of changes to how you're doing it. But you know, right now in New York, it's hard to imagine if a brand new stage three patient walked into, um, you know, NYU or, or Memorial, how they would manage that. Um, you know, if someone was EGFR mutant, would you even consider putting them on a TKI for a little while until they could get by uh, to start on chemo radiation? Or as um, Stephen mentioned, you know, you could certainly give a couple of cycles or a few cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, it's not better than giving it afterwards, but it's probably uh, a reasonable temporizing measure. But right now, we're not doing things all that different. Um, although, uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a patient uh, at our institution who had a single mediastinoscopy positive microscopic you know, N2 node. And after having a quick multidisciplinary discussion, because the ORs were mostly empty and we stopped all our um, uh, elective procedures and we had lots of time and space, we made a decision to actually go ahead and proceed with primary resection despite that, because they have a better prognosis to just manage them in the adjuvant setting rather than stop and arrange uh, six weeks of neoadjuvant chemo radiation that might put that patient at higher risk. And I agree with all of you that I think stage three disease is potentially have a long-term survival, although it's about 20%, but we still try to attain that. So in Hong Kong, we would have treated as as normal in a way is that we give them as normal as possible. But I think this, all has to be done within the perspective of what is a statistic, statistic of your hospital. If there's zero so-called infection rate in your oncology department, if there's not a single staff with that infection uh, within your department, I think business as usual, I think is perfectly acceptable. But on the other hand, when you start have one staff with the infection, or when you start have one patient with the infection, then everything we said may have to change a little bit because the risk is all of a sudden change the paradigm already. Great, thank you. Um, so we have previously discussed some modifications to treatment that we've been taking, but this continues to be a really hot topic that physicians um, continue to refine and adapt in practice. So what are some other therapeutic approaches that um, you have all changed to due to the pandemic? So for us, we're, we're really trying to, to spread things out as much as we can and completely agree with, with what Tony had said. Um, you know, especially in the maintenance setting, someone who's had a good response to treatment is past a year. The, the Q3 week dosing interval, I don't think we need to be as dogmatic and spacing those things out. Uh, you know, the, the risk of coming in, the risk of exposure really changes that equation a bit. We are using much more four weekly Atezo, for example, that's FDA approved when we can get it approved, four weekly Dervalumab and really just, just spacing things out omitting doses if, if we can. And, and I think, you know, it's interesting, uh, Nate brought up the issue of having a patient who's uh, just has a single mediastinal node. And I, I totally agree that there is completely room for judgment here. I think that what could be really valuable here is that we can test some things and learn some things about the feasibility of stopping uh, a TKI for four or six weeks and seeing you know, whether there is significant progression or not, and then resuming treatment and checking that they would respond again, or checking about going longer intervals uh, uh, for immunotherapy, as as several have said, uh, Steve, you just did, you know, that, that uh, the, these issues of, of every three week treatment are just because they're in the protocols, doesn't mean that that is the pinnacle of medical evolution. And we just haven't asked, but with the pressure and the challenges of, of what we're facing now, there is absolutely room for judgment and, and, and deviating from some of these that are more ritual based approaches with a good rationale and, and learning from it. This is an occasion to, to get a better sense to validate that patients can do really well on every 
four every six week pembrolizumab potentially for a long period of time. So I hope that we capture some of this information. Obviously, it's it's not being done in the context of a prospective trial, but but if we're observant, I think there's a lot to learn, and it's completely appropriate to use some judgment in these really uh, extenuating circumstances we're in right now. But yeah, you know, if your precedent is correct, this epidemic will finish very quickly. So the, the question is that, will you continue this practice when the ep ep pandemic starts to settle? Or are you allowed to continue this less frequent treatment, you know, if that is the case? Well, I don't, I mean, I don't know that, but again, I, I wonder, and one of the things I'd wonder about for you, because now we're watching China and we're starting to see hints of reinfection and the numbers going up. We don't know. I, I don't think that the faucet's going to stop and we're all going back to normal life in six weeks. I don't, I mean, whatever our president says, uh, really we've established has no correlation with reality and, uh, or it is inversely correlated with what we should expect. And, and because of that, I think most of us are not so sanguine to think that it's just business as usual come mid-May or beyond. And so this is, this is going to have a, a tempo that's kind of ongoing in the U S at least, uh, that's, that's kind of staggered variable. We're not probably going to shut down air travel. And so this is going to be a smoldering, I'm afraid, ongoing issue, though, maybe not paralyzing the economy and shutting us all down. But there's going to be a looming question of, of exposure for a long time to come. And I, I think that we will continue to need to ask questions whether we really do need to have people get their scans every two or three months if they're doing well, and whether we needed it to have people getting uh, their immunotherapy per the label and the study just because it was in that was the way it was tested. There's a real potential risk to overtreating, and what we do may be overtreating in a COVID world. They did not do any of these pivotal studies in Wuhan, China in late 2019, early 2020. And so we, I think, can't extrapolate what was done in trials two or three years ago to what we're facing right now. And your point's well taken, but I just think this isn't going to go away in no, a which I agree. Right. One of the other things that we are doing um, now, which is different, um, and you know, I certainly have uh, witnessed this in my own practice, that earlier a Q3 weekly paclitaxel regimen in combination with carboplatin and immunotherapy for squamous uh, cell, non-small cell lung cancer metastatic patients used to seem quite onerous, but I think in the COVID pandemic uh, era, it actually makes sense for us to perhaps grab on a Q3 week regimen, add on growth factor support and, um, you know, minimize exposure because uh, now these patients don't have to come in once every three, once every week to get the day one 815 regimen or the day one Eight, eight regimen out of a 21 day regimen as many of us were doing for our squamous patients. Um, I'm also using uh, growth factor support uh, more liberally, um, I think, uh, and justifiably so uh, just to prevent um, complications. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And uh, I just wanted to go back to the last topic one thing that uh, in terms of how long this is going to last, even after things return practically or, or perhaps even in a real sense to, to the risk that they, you know, similar to the way they were before, the perceived risk is going to last a lot longer. And our patients are already terrified. I mean, they call every day before their appointments to see if they really need to come. Can they put it off? Can they skip their treatment? I have people on trials who just want to not be on the trial anymore and just stop their treatments. I have people on uh, stable maintenance therapy who are like, you know what, I'm done. I'm not coming in for a while, uh, which in that case may even be appropriate. But um, I, I, I worry a little that we're going to have to transition people back into understanding 
um, that their their treatment is important. And you know, I, I don't know if any of you read uh, Mark Lewis's New England Journal um, editorial that just came out this week, and his you know uh, concern that delays and you know skipping treatments was perhaps uh, eventually going to lead to a so-called second wave of deaths of cancer patients who weren't necessarily getting their treatment that they needed while it was put off during this period and something that we need to be aware of. Um, I, we, we have been looking at our cancer center volumes and this was uh, just put out on Twitter even by our cancer center that our volumes are down 20% even though we're open for business. You know, where are these people going? I mean, they're maybe just not coming to get their treatment right now. And it's something, even after we open back up, I worry that that might continue for a while. I, mean, I, support, I support Nathan's point on this, but I think it's very important to classify the patient into different category. There are treatment that we should not delay, but there are treatment that we may be able to delay, although we don't have evidence, but you know, biologically, pharmacologically, that we may be able to delay. So using one statement, I think it's very difficult to cover all patients. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but if we were to take a very hard decision and discussion among the colleagues to say, what are the essential ones that we cannot do any delay, but what are the ones that we have the option of having a delay? I think that will have to be a very internal, vigorous decision before we can kind of say who is who and who need what. I think one thing that won't go away is, is our use of telemedicine. And this has really forced us to lay down uh, a pretty semi-permanent infrastructure on in how to deliver care remotely. And in a lot of ways, it's it's better. It is objectively better. And if someone's on a stable treatment, why can't I manage them from from across the country? Why do I have to have someone flying in? I think that piece will stay with us for the better. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's interesting. I I very much agree also with Nate's point that uh, we we're I think almost every cancer center, probably everyone, is seeing decreased volumes, and twenty percent may be a relatively small drop compared to many. Um, I, I think you know just about everything that happens is happening at a slower rate with with more resistance. I mean, the with with sadly many of our centers having uh, having to be very judicious about PPE, you know, having enough equipment and and activities like Bronx and uh, more intensive interventions being being regulated more than usual. It's kind of like the, the week between Christmas and New Year's ongoing. I mean, there's still maybe, you know, I think people with small cell are still gonna go to the ER and get seen, but a lot of other things are gonna happen at a much slower pace because docs are busy doing other things and, and the, the procedures just aren't being done at the pace that they would be done under other circumstances. So I think we may see the, this is like anti-screening, or we might see uh, a lot of stage three and four disease that could have been picked up, uh, you know, earlier uh, because everyone's taken a zero on on uh, you know more proactive management in this period, just along the lines kind of what what Mark Lewis had said in uh, in the New England Journal. Like, you know, we we don't want to drag our feet too much. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for obviously participating in these fantastic discussions and sharing with one another and with our listeners. And thank you for Dr. Mock for being available to discuss this with us tonight. Um, and so tonight, uh, right now we're going to open up the question and answer portion of the webinar. So if you go to the ask question and answer box on the right corner of your screen, you can type your question directly in the space that is in the box, and then you can hit submit. Uh, so um, as we have in the last couple of weeks, it's exciting. We have a nice uh, list of questions rolling in, so we'll get through as many as we can. Um, so first up, in the UK, uh, the national guidelines were recently published recently was to withhold all systemic treatments at priority level six. For example, non-curative treatment with an intermediate 15% to 50% chance of palliation. Uh, or temporary tumor control and less than one year expected extension to life. Would the US or Hong Kong have a similar view on a, on a risk benefit view? I think there is a bit of a philosophy behind all this. Uh, UK is one country that don't even believe in radiation to the brain. <laughs> and uh, based on the study they published. And uh, so the question is that uh, what are the treatment 
with the impact and how big is the impact is value. So I think it's not a restrict answer. It's not really a guideline that someone sitting in an office can decide. I think it has to be the doctor patient discussion to decide something is worthwhile rather than a regulation that demand that this is the cutoff. This is the level that you are not supposed to be 65. You're not going to get anything. So I don't think there should be a specific cutoff. It has to be a patient doctor decision rather than a governmental decision. That's my own opinion. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And um, I think uh, without getting too much into it, we will all recognize that um, the UK has a very different way of judging what their um, government uh, social med medicine system is willing to pay for and, and what their cutoffs for what they consider valuable treatment. Um, it's very different from the United States where we really don't make those kinds of judgments about what our payers will pay for. Um, but you know, I think it's always valuable to discuss whether your treatment truly has uh, a value to the patient and whether you should be treating something based upon the best available evidence versus, you know, it's easier than having that tough conversation about stopping treatment. Yeah, and you know, we are, we are having these conversations in our clinics already for a first line newly diagnosed metastatic non small cell lung cancer, I'm less likely to tell them, uh, let's hold off on your therapy compared to third, fourth line, fifth line, elderly, frail patient, um, you know, who may or may not benefit from additional treatment. So I, I do think that it has to be very patient directed and focused. Well, I would say that it, this has forced us to reflect carefully on whether the, uh, on the, the anticipated benefit versus risk more than we might have sometimes reflexively before, but I think most of us fall uh, on a different end of the spectrum than looking for, you know, uh, more than a year is the only metric that is worth treating. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Mock, this looks like a question for you. So um, as you mentioned, new patients are suffering due to delays. Could you comment on delays related to scheduling tissue biopsies and whether comprehensive genomic profiling using liquid biopsies, for example, with GARDEN360, could be an option that you would consider upfront for treatment naive patients in this current situation where there's so many constraints on capacity and resources? So um, it comes to a different level of question is that whether we can replace tissue biopsy with a liquid biopsy based on only molecular diagnostic. I think this is a big jump. I mean, you know, yes, this is a circumstantial that we may have some delay in tissue, but ethically, can we really use the molecular diagnosis to replace the tissue diagnosis? I think that it would take a lot more science than what we just take as a circumstances. So at this moment, I'm still reluctant. I still do not want to label someone with cancer until under the microscope we see cancer cell, uh, because there's still a certain degree of false positive uh, or even false negative with the molecular diagnosis based on plasma. So at this moment, I don't think we're up there yet to call someone cancer just based on a blood-based molecular diagnosis. And also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in Hong Kong, if we rely on Garden 360 uh, or Foundation, we still have to send it to the United States. And so the time delay would be huge anyway. So I, I don't think in the immediate future, I see it as a change in paradigm. You know, I think that a lot of us on this call have already been using a lot of liquid biopsy for our known cancer patients um, when maybe we don't have enough tissue or tissues exhausted. Um, and, and, you know, I think that one thing we've done relying on more is, is, is mobile phlebotomy. I think this is a, a great uh, innovative step where we send the phlebotomist to patients' homes so they don't come into the cancer center um, to get the blood drawn. And, you know, with a quick turnaround, we can get those results and, and really affect therapy. But I think a lot of it depends on your specific situation, as we've said before. Yeah. If you're in New York City... Uh, yeah, but Steve, on, on the other hand, if you've got someone on a CT scan with a lung nodule or a lung mass, and then you send the blood and then, you know, it, it show ALK, then you may be comfortable to give, you know, TKI without the tissue. Or you still want the tissue before you give the TKI. So in a perfect world, I, I want the tissue. I want everything. <laughs> but if you're practicing in Manhattan right now, um, it's a hypothetical, you can't get a bronchoscopy. And if you have, a, you know, especially if you have the right phenotype, a patient uh, you don't have a diagnosis, but it looks like cancer on the CT scan. Uh, mm -hmm. It really seems like it a metastatic, uh, a lot of disease there. You send a liquid biopsy, it comes back with ALK. 
yeah, I think I would start that person on a TKI. I think I'd feel pretty good about it. And, and we'd expect to see a response very quickly. And it's not ideal and it's not standard of care, but under extreme circumstances, I think it could be reasonable. Uh, this is a question for the panel. So if a patient just started immunotherapy or immunotherapy with chemotherapy and was COVID positive, but they were asymptomatic, would you just recommend staying with immunotherapy alone and hold the chemotherapy until they are COVID negative? Um, allow me to start. I think I would hold both. For the reason is this, is number one, uh, COVID-19 is potentially fatal. And you really do not know which direction this patient is going. But if the patient is going to that direction and you're still on some kind of therapy, you actually have no idea whether that is going to compound the issue for the patient. That's number one. Number two, uh, from what my limited understanding, is the virus itself damage the patient, but at day 10, why do they get worse? It's because of the cytokine storm, the cytokine reaction to the virus. There have been some data that are coming out with that, and we really do not know whether our immunotherapy can compound that reaction. I think right now the science is not really uh, clear, you know, what is the potential influence of immunotherapy on your immune response to the uh, COVID virus, that could be very damaging and fatal to the patient as well. So personally, if I got someone who got positive, I would stop both. And I think that's very reasonable. I think there's a lot, even just when you have someone on chemo and immunotherapy, you don't, and you don't have COVID in the mix, you really don't know whether it's the chemo, the immunotherapy, or the combination that is working or necessarily causing side effects unless it's it's a very common associated one but COVID-19 uh, then adds another huge variable that may interact with any or all of these so I think it makes good sense to step back and try to minimize the variables if you can. Yeah, and I think, um, well, you also have to keep in mind that immune therapy has a really long half-life so skipping a single dose on someone who's already on it I don't know how much you're really going to impact um, what it might do, but uh, certainly skipping chemo, I think, makes sense. And certainly not starting treatment in someone who's positive if you can get away with it. Uh, and the one exception I would say would be patients on a, on a doing well on a TKI, like uh, osmertinib or electinib, um, as we discussed earlier uh, on with, uh, with Tony before this started. I think we um, don't have any real good reason to think that they couldn't stay on that if they're doing well uh, just because they have the infection. And, you know, I think I would like to raise a point here that, you know, as we move ahead over the next two to three to four to six weeks, uh, you know, how do you define somebody who's COVID negative, right? Uh, somebody who's had the disease and uh, there are certainly reports coming out that patients can remain positive. So they can test out positive three weeks out, four weeks out. Um, and, you know, should we be using antibody testing now? Um, maybe a very reasonable question, um, especially to return doctors and nurses and other healthcare workers into um, back into the workforce, but also perhaps for patients who should we select uh, to, um, re how, how do we select patients to reinstitute therapy um, is going to be a challenge that we're gonna face. And we will have to observe if prior COVID infection has any impact on subsequent therapy. And I think that's, we, we have no idea about that. We're really gonna have to watch that as a community to see if there are later consequences. I think, I think there are two levels uh, to that question. One is that what is the risk of the patient infecting others? The other is that what is the risk of the patient uh, having symptoms again if, if we defer the therapy? I think for the patient who kind of recover asymptomatic, even you know, as long as they got antibody, I think the chance of them having a recurrence of symptoms is actually low. Uh, but then on the first question, I actually don't think we have to answer. We do not know how likely the, that, that this so-called the post-infection, how long they're going to infect others. I think that part, we really don't have any idea. In Hong Kong, we take a very arbitrary, not scientific, but then negative testing twice that we classify them as less infectious. It may not be absolute science, but I think it is a sensible approach to test them negative twice within uh, one week apart, then we find them relatively safe. But not sure that whether that is the complete correct approach. 
And I just wanted to, um, one of the biggest things that I've taken from talking to, uh, hearing from Tony about the Hong Kong experience that really is radically different from the United States, which still makes no sense to me, is that testing is just so readily available there. And they, you know, uh, talking about a patient testing negative twice, I mean, our patients sometimes can't get a single test. Um, and uh, this is the key. This is why Hong Kong has so few cases, because they're so aggressive about testing everyone and then tracking the positives so that they don't continue to spread it. And if we're going to ever emerge from this um, foxhole that the entire country is in right now, we have to be able to test people. And, you know, just in the cancer center, everything we talk about, you know, you see something on the scan, what are you going to do about it? Well, you know, if I could test them and find by lunchtime whether they were positive, I would know what to do. It's uh, what if they're admitted on immunotherapy and they have, you know, what we think might be pneumonitis? Well, we should be able to test them and tell whether it's COVID or it's pneumonitis. And this has to happen if we're going to move beyond this. Yeah, I agree entirely. I think we have to do this on different level. So there has to be the hospital level where you build your testing team. I mean, uh, given that we are a uh, universal hospital, so we have a virology lab, so it's easy to gear up that testing ability. Uh, in a lot of general hospitals, they may not have strong hold in virology. Uh, you know, in a way, they need a level two lab before they can do the viral testing. And so basically, some of the hospital may have difficulty having their own. But then come to the second level is in the government or the community level, whether they can set up central lab to do the testing. Like, for example, UK, uh, from what I just briefly see in the news yesterday is that uh, GSK and uh, AstraZeneca uh, combined the effort to set up some lab in UK to help to, to do the testing. So I think it, it, in a sense is that, yes, hospital can do something, but I think both on the government and the society level that they really have to make the test a lot more readily available before we can calm down a little bit of say who is safe who's not safe otherwise it would be very difficult we be locking everybody in house uh, you know just to because of the fear but the testing will try to relieve some of the fear among the population all right thank you that appears to be all the time we now have for questions so again a huge thank you to the faculty tonight doctors uh, dr west dr Pennell, dr lu dr agarwal and dr mock uh, for taking the time out of your busy practice to sit down with Ankai virtually and convey these pivotal discussion topics with our audience this evening. Uh, and thank you again to our listeners. I truly hope you're able to gain some really valuable insight into how the clinical practice is changing in oncology during this pandemic. Uh, again, we are making these webcasts our regularly occurring series. You'll be able to listen back and watch this webinar again shortly. And um, our next one is scheduled for 8 p.m. on April 15th, so next Wednesday, same time. And for next week's program, we'll have another very special edition. So Dr. Jarushka Naidu uh, will be joining us for next week's program. And Dr. Naidu is an assistant professor of oncology at Johns Hopkins Medicine. So in closing, continue to visit OnClive.com, sign up for our e-newsletters, and follow us on social media on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook to get updates on when we will be broadcasting more of these webinars and for more oncology resources. Um, or you can also find our COVID-19 Resource Center on OnClive.com. So that concludes this evening's webcast. Thank you so much and have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.